In the beginning was matter, and matter begot the amoeba. If there is no God, that is the series of events that is forced on a person. You see, you would have to suggest that the cosmos is all that there is, all that there was, or all that there ever will be. You would have to say that there's no intelligent, supernatural creator who brings life into existence. And so you would have to say that somewhere in the distant past, life arose from non-living chemicals. Now, there's a very serious scientific problem with this. It breaks one of the most fundamental biological laws known to humankind, the law of biogenesis. The law of biogenesis is very simple to understand. Bio means life. Genesis means beginning. The law of biogenesis simply says that life comes from previously existing life of its own kind in our material, natural world. For years, people didn't think that that was the case, and so they naturally thought you could just get non-living chemicals to produce life. And they had examples for that. In fact, what they called scientific examples. They said, sure enough, if you will take a steak and place it on your kitchen counter in the middle of the summer and come back in maybe a week or two, do you know what you'll find? Oh, you'll find maggots that have spontaneously generated on that steak. And that was supposedly evidence of life coming from non-living chemicals. They said, that's not all. If you were to take some old sweaty rags and you were to wrap them with some wheat and put them in the corner of a barn and come back in a month or so, you would have spontaneously generated mice and sometimes rats from the chemical properties of the air and the rags and the wheat. Well, several scientists were studying this and they thought, hold on just a second, we're not sure that these chemical processes are bringing about life. And they did some experiments. In fact, they're very famous experiments in virtually every biology textbook that you will ever read. One of them is by a man named Francisco Reddy or Francisco Reedy. You spell his name R-E-D-I. His experiment was very, very simple. He simply took some meat, put it in a jar, several jars actually, and he put those jars to one side and he didn't cover them or put anything on top of the jars. The other group of jars, he put meat in the bottom of those and hermetically sealed, airtight, these jars on this side and then he watched. He watched as flies flew into the meat that was uncovered and they tried to fly into the meat that was covered and they couldn't. And maggots formed on the uncovered meat. Maggots did not form on the covered meat. And so he said, I think flies are producing maggots. Now the naysayers of his experiment said, hold on just a second. Your problem is you didn't let air get into the meat in the sealed jars. And that's what it takes for spontaneous generation to occur air to get into the meat. And so he said, well, let's try it again. Put some jars over here with meat in the bottom and no seal. Put some jars in the middle with meat in the bottom and gauze-like netting substance on the top. And then put the sealed jars with meat over here. Flies landed on the sealed jars, couldn't get in. Flies landed on the netting that was on top of the middle jars. And maggots formed on the netting, but not in the meat. And then over here, the maggots formed on the meat in the unsealed jars. So in 1660, Reedy said, I think that flies are producing maggots. I don't think that they are spontaneously generating. And everybody said, we think you're right. But then basically when they asked him, what about other forms of life? Can they spontaneously generate? He said, yeah, just not maggots. Well, that idea continued for about another 200 years until the mid-1860s. In the mid-1860s, a man came along that you're probably very familiar with, even though you might not know that you are. If you were to go to your refrigerator in the morning and pull out a gallon of milk or apple juice, on the side of it you would read that it's pasteurized. What does it mean that milk is pasteurized? Well, it means that there's a process called pasteurization that was named for a scientist named Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur proved once and for all that life doesn't spontaneously generate from non-living chemicals. In fact, in 1860, 1868 or so around that time, Pasteur did some experiments where he would put meat broth or hay broth in the bottom of a flask and he would boil it. 
And then in the 1860s, they had microscopes and they would zoom in on that broth and they would see that before he boiled it, there were millions of swimming microscopic organisms. After he boiled it, it killed all of those microscopic organisms. Well, the interesting thing about this particular experiment was that those flasks had a special S-shaped curve. So air could get back into the broth, but that special S-shape was designed to catch all microscopic organisms as they went through the neck. And it was very effective, it did. Some of those flasks he would keep for over a year and then break the neck off. The air would go back unhindered to the meat broth and microscopic organisms would form. Reedy, Pasteur, other scientists who did experiments like this proved once and for all that life cannot, does not, come from non-living chemicals. In fact, evolutionist Martin Moe correctly commented that a century of sensational discoveries in the biological sciences has taught us that life arises only from life. Even the eminent evolutionist George Gaylord Simpson observed that there is no serious doubt that biogenesis is the rule, that life comes only from other life, that a cell, the unit of life, is always and exclusively the product or offspring of another cell. Now that puts people who don't believe in God in a very serious quandary. If this material universe is all that there is and all that there was and all that there ever will be, and life somehow in the beginning came from non-living chemicals, and yet every single scientific experiment ever done in the biological sciences proves that can't be the case, then what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is that there was a supernatural intelligent being at the beginning who brought life into existence. Now, what you'll hear from the atheistic evolutionary teaching is that we just haven't found how life came from non-living chemicals. We think it did. We suggest it had to. Like George Wald said back in 1950, he said, to make an organism demands the right substances in the right proportions and in the right arrangement. We do not think that anything more is needed, but that is problem enough. One has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. And yet, here we are. You see, he says, hey, this isn't possible, yet we're here, so it must have happened in the past. So we've got to find out how it did happen and yet here's the problem. It's not that science hasn't found the answer yet. It's that science has found the answer, and the answer is that spontaneous generation is impossible in nature. It's not as if one day we're going to find the answer, as if if we do a million more experiments, it's still out there. We're just in a system or situation of doubt right now. No, listen. Every single scientific experiment in biology ever done proves that life cannot spontaneously generate from non-living chemicals. About 50 years after Wald made his statement, Kenneth Miller and Joseph Levine in their book Biology wrote that Louis Pasteur convinced other scientists that the hypothesis of spontaneous generation was not correct. In other words, Pasteur showed that all living things come from other living things. This change in thinking represented a major shift in the way scientists viewed living things. Major shift indeed. If that statement is true, and scientifically it's one of the most valid scientific statements ever made, atheism cannot be true. And in the beginning, God is the real scientific answer.